Morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's COVID-19 K-12 Summit, a collaborative event in partnership with Arizona State University and the Center for the Future of Arizona, which we also call CFA. I'm part of the CFA team and my name is Amanda Burke and I am our Managing Director for Strategic Initiatives and Impact. And we're so glad you could join us for this learning opportunity, especially on a Saturday morning. CFA is a statewide nonprofit organization whose mission is to bring Arizonans together from across the state to build a stronger and brighter future. Much of our work is in the education space in collaboration with many of your learning communities. And we have seen over the past year firsthand how K-12 districts and charter schools are adapting and implementing innovative solutions to meet the needs of kids and families in your learning communities. And we're excited to be here today with you with an incredible group of scientists, medical experts, and education leaders from across Arizona to share what they're learning from the K-12 COVID-19 testing pilot with ADHS, ASU, and 14 district and charter schools, many of whom you'll have a chance to hear from a little bit later today. But first, I'd like to introduce Tamara Duzer, Associate Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for ASU's Knowledge Enterprise Operations, who will share just a little bit more about why we're gathered here today. Thank you very much for that introduction, Amanda, and uh, good morning to everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, as Amanda mentioned, I'm uh, Tim Duzer. I look after operations for the Knowledge Enterprise at ASU, which has uh, meant that I've been uh, very involved in all of our COVID response efforts, including testing and other health management efforts, along with the research activities, uh, and so partnering across the university. Um, we've done a number of things to try to be of assistance to our community, uh, which is what consistent with what ASU tries to do, uh, which includes we have uh, closed about 15,000 uh, case investigations. So we've been assisting the county with contact tracing and case inve investigations. Our Luminosity Lab uh, created a website where we were able to connect hospitals and providers of PPE, um, as well as manufacture some of the critical uh, supplies during the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we have, I believe, about 150 different research teams that are working on things from, you know, vaccine candidates to, uh, you know, treatment options to new testing technologies. Uh, and so we have a large group of people at work on those items. And then as many of you may not already know, we uh, did stand up drive-through testing sites uh, around the entire state in both rural and uh, our major metropolitan areas. And we've done uh, nearly 600,000 tests to date uh, for the community. And then most recently in the last uh, two weeks, we have um, been providing logistic support and operating the State Farm Mass Vaccination Site uh, with our very own nursing students and other employees out there and plan to set up another mass vaccination site. So we've been uh, hard at work trying to help the community in addition to uh, the K through 12 pilot that we'll talk more about today. Um, so there's still a whole bunch of work to do. Um, so we've all been hard at work and we've, we're not out of the woods yet. So uh, we're hoping that today will be helpful to the group in continuing to navigate uh, the situation that we're in. I'm uh, a parent, uh, so I very much appreciate all of the uh, work that you all are doing to um, try to bring our kids to school safely. safely. So um, we're going to do what we can to be of assistance to you in that, um, and we'll continue to do so as we move forward. Um, we have been, um, as Amanda mentioned, working with 14 school districts on a number of things associated with um, the safe return to school um, and just anything else that we can think of that we could be of assistance and we're incredibly grateful for all of your efforts. Uh, so while, like you, we don't have all of the answers, we've at least gathered, group, gathered together uh, subject matter experts that can hopefully uh, answer some of the questions that you have, talk about what we've been doing at ASU and what's worked and what we've learned. Um, and provide you with some, uh, you know, reliable and trusted information so that you can help uh, the communities you serve. So really appreciate everyone's time and participation. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, who's one of the organizers of the event uh, with Amanda. And uh, thanks for everybody's participation. And I hope it's a uh, beneficial morning for you. Thank you so much, Tamara. Okay, so um, I'm going to just take a moment here and go over the agenda for the day. So over the next two hours, we will hear from subject matter experts, 
um, and leadership from K through 12 districts across our state who will share best practices and address the challenges and questions you voice during registration. First, Dr. Josh LeBaire will discuss what we currently know about how the novel SARS-2 virus that causes COVID-19 spreads in congregate settings such as schools and the different types and uses of available tests for asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals. Next, Dr. David Sklar will review different COVID-19 vaccines, address common questions about their capabilities and limitations, and provide strategies for raising vaccine awareness and acceptance among students, staff, and parents. Then we will take a quick break, during which time you will have the opportunity to ask Dr. Sklar, a practicing ER doctor and professor of medicine, questions about COVID-19. After the break, leadership from four diverse school districts across the state will discuss major successes, challenges, and lessons learned. Lastly, a panel of experts from Arizona State University, the University of Arizona, and Arizona Department of Health Services will do their best to address your most pressing questions and concerns. Just a quick note before we start, during the symposium, the Q&A box will be live, and we will encourage you to enter any additional questions you may have as we go along, and we will be monitoring this. Um, so at this point, uh, it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Josh LeBaire. Dr. LeBaire is the executive director of ASU's Biodesign Institute and one of the nation's foremost investigators in the field of personalized diagnostics. In response to the coronavirus pandemic, Dr. LeBaire quickly repurposed expertise, equipment, and personnel to accelerate testing. The new ASU Biodesign Clinical Testing Laboratory developed a federally authorized diagnostic test known commercially as a qPCR to detect coronavirus for individuals who may have been exposed to the virus. This new lab gained CLIA certification for testing nasal swab samples and then became the first in the country to run saliva tests for coronavirus for the public. Dr. LeBaire earned his medical degree and a PhD in biochemistry and biophysics from the University of California, San Francisco. He completed his medical residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and a clinical fellowship in oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he also founded the Harvard Institute of Proteomics. So Dr. LeBaire, I will turn it over to you. Hi, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, uh, this is a small enough group, uh, so please don't hesitate uh, if you need to interrupt me at some point because I'm not clear or you have a question. I think it looks like um, you're going to run the, the slides then, or do, am yeah, I doing that's it? correct. I'll be advancing them for you. Okay, why don't you go ahead and advance the slide. All right, so um, the first thing I'm going to say, and I know you, probably many of you have heard all this before, uh, but just to remind you, this, you know, this, what has made this SARS-CoV-2 virus, that's the name of the virus, uh, so virulent and so problematic is that it has three characteristics. Uh, we say that it sort of won the trifecta here. Um, the first is, is severity, and it's, it's kind of a maddening aspect of its severity because while um, it clearly kills people, I mean, we are um, uh, losing uh, countless people every single day. Uh, two people a minute, something to that effect. Um, uh, it also is very mild in other people. And I think that has been a challenge for this virus. Um, if this virus made everybody sick, if it made everybody get a bad flu, you'd see a lot better behavior from everyone because they would know they don't want to get it. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, better than 80% of people don't feel anything, or fortunately, I suppose. Uh, and, and so um, uh, they're less worried about it. But it, 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 it is 10 times worse than the flu in terms of mortality. It is a, a, a severe uh, virus for many people. Um, the second is it spreads incredibly fast. Uh, uh, we'll come back to this, but it, it spreads by airborne transmission, uh, which makes it one of the worst ways of spreading because it's one of the hardest ways to control. And it is stealthy. Uh, and by stealthy, I mean that um, the virus spreads from people who don't know they're sick. Uh, and that's what's been one of the biggest challenges. Uh, there are two other viruses in this family of viruses that are also deadly. You've heard of the SARS virus and you've heard of the MERS virus. Uh, those are both deadly, but they've really all told killed less than uh, maybe tens of thousands of people total, uh, not like the, you know, the, the near million that we've seen now. And that's because um, when people get those viruses, they're sick when they're spreading it. So they know they're ill. Um, this one is challenging because people spread it and they don't know they're ill. And I think this comes back to the reason why um, some testing in the schools is gonna be so important is, is uh, the only way to find out if somebody is ill is to test them. 
So let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just to remind us that this virus spreads exponentially. Um, each node here uh, can give the virus to two or three people, roughly. That's what the numbers suggest in the context of this virus. Now, it's not always true that one person gives it to three other people and that person gives it to three other people. Sometimes one person gives it to 10 people and another person doesn't give it to anybody. Um, but it's also important to remember that this spread doesn't happen in an instant. So if you click forward here, you're gonna, um, you're gonna see that this first person will spread it to one person to two people and then go ahead, click again. And then you know it, it sort of spreads over time. And I emphasize this part because um, if we can interrupt this whole chain, then we, we limit the number of people that get the virus. Um, and, and that's the goal here. Limiting the number of people that get the virus does a lot of things for us. First of all, it, re it reduces the chance that somebody will get severely ill and die from it. We don't want that at all. But it also limits the overall burden of virus in the community. And the more virus that's around in our community, the more opportunities the virus has to mutate and, and form strains that are more difficult to manage. Uh, we, we, we really don't want to you know, become a culture uh, container for this virus and let it grow to huge numbers. So we want to stop it before it has a chance to spread. So if you could go to the next slide. So this just reminds us that, th that this virus spreads by an airborne route. Um, it, it, the virus surfs along the droplets of saliva that come out of our mouths when we speak and breathe. Um, and I know we don't always think about that, but when we speak, and this has been documented, we produce about 2,600 droplets per second, per second. So that's a lot of droplets that are coming out of our mouths as we're talking. That means that as we converse with somebody, we're, we're, um, we're surrounded by a cloud of our own moisture. And, um, and that, that it becomes air that the other person breathes and it's the opportunity for the virus to ride along those droplets and infect the other person, right? So, um, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about this sort of six foot spacing, and I think we're all familiar with that and it is important, but keep in mind that that, that number is sort of arbitrary. It came from studies done in the 1930s, uh, so almost a century ago, uh, when they couldn't even measure the kinds of droplets that this virus, the size of the droplets is, that this virus is traveling on. Those larger droplets they could measure back then fall to the floor in three to six feet. But the droplets that um, the virus we know now travels on can linger in the air for a while, uh, minutes even, and some, in some cases even longer than that. So um, uh, it's around, the virus is out, it's in the air, it floats around and um, all of this, I think you can see where I'm heading here is, to, is that mask wearing is really crucial. Um, uh, we have clearly documented that masks prevent these things from getting into our, our respiratory systems and infecting us. And the key, of course, is that you want a mask on both ends. You want a mask on the person speaking and a ma mask on the person listening. Uh, and that adds sort of two layers of filter that prevent the virus from ever making it from person A to person B. And, and many, many documented cases of people where there's been an infected person in the room, but both people are wearing masks and the other person doesn't get infected. So masks clearly work. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, um, uh, so ASU has taken what we call an offensive strategy against the virus. It's great to do physical distancing. We talked about that. We talked about the importance of mask wearing. That's not enough. Um, the virus is still spreading despite that. And, um, and so part of, part of our strategy has been testing. And, and we think that testing is important, not only because it helps us identify those people who are ill and, and then allows us to get them out of circulation until they get better so that they don't have an opportunity to spread the virus, but it also actually alters behavior. It actually helps encourage people, believe it or not, to um, uh, uh, avoid spread. And you know, I think ASU is a good example of that. You know, um, we, we randomly test the students in our, in our uh, school and uh, you know, every week, a number of them get an email telling them that it's their turn to get tested. And we have seen um, transmission rates among our students at a very low level, far lower than in the community at large. And so we've had a much less, much less spread within the ASU community because we do this random testing. Uh, so you know, I think that testing is itself an intervention. It, 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 it prevents the spread of the virus and it helps us identify quickly people who need to get separated until they get better. So that's part of the, the reason we're using the strategy. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Right, 
So um, our lab uh, set up a clinical testing scheme. Um, we used technology that we already had for another purpose. We pivoted it to, to do what's called this qPCR test. I'm going to come back to testing in a minute. Our first tests were in at the beginning of April last year, and um, uh, it has only grown since then. Uh, today, typically in a in a day, we will do you know anywhere between you know five and seven thousand tests uh, often. Uh, uh, and you know, as Tamara mentioned earlier, we're doing them all over the state of Arizona. Um, the, uh, thanks to the state of Arizona, we're, um, those are underwritten by the Arizona Department of Health, so they they are free to the public. Um, uh, and we we have used saliva for a variety of reasons, in large part because it is the 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 medium by which this virus spreads, and so it's the most relevant source of sample to look at. It it is um, as accurate as the the nasal testing. And it's a lot easier to get the sample. Um, uh, it's less traumatic. I think you know, um, it, it, all you do is spit through a straw into a tube. And um, uh, so we were able to collect a lot more samples that way. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to briefly remind you of the different kinds of tests that there are out there. I'm going to start on the right-hand side here with the antibody test, just so that we can dismiss it. The antibody test is a test that's used to determine if you had the virus in the past. Uh, your antibodies won't be apparent until about 10 days or 14 days after you get infected. So um, antibody tests are not in any way helpful in determining if someone is currently infected with the virus. Really what they tell you is that sometime in the past that person had the virus. Um, there are three other tests listed here um, for testing uh, whether someone is currently infected. The LAMP rapid home test is a very specific test. It's one that you need to get a prescription for. I'm not going to really talk about that. Um, it's just, uh, it is a, an amplification test. Uh, the rapid test, the antigen test, you've probably heard about that one. That one um, uh, is a, it, 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 the, its advantage is that you can actually run the assay very quickly. The assay that we do in our lab takes a couple hours to run. This particular assay takes only 15 minutes to run. Um, however, if you want to do a lot, a lot of samples, um, you have to line them up 15 minutes after each 15 minutes. So it's not always as fast as it sounds. Um, the bigger problem with the antigen test is while it's useful in people who are sick and who feel ill, it is not useful in people who are not. If you don't have symptoms, there's a very good chance that this test will not detect the virus in you. And that's a huge problem because one of the main reasons for testing is to determine uh, those people who are ill and who don't know they're ill. That's what we're after here. So uh, that's why we focus on this RT-PCR test, the one that we use for the saliva testing. Um, it is the most accurate test out there for detecting the virus. It measures the RNA in the virus. That's the genetic material in the virus. Um, we have a machine that amplifies that RNA. Um, the test we use can detect down to around 200 virus particles per sample. Uh, keep in mind that most people when they're ill have around 10,000 virus particles per sample. So it's quite sensitive test. Um, it, the test we use tests for three viral genes. So there is virtually zero chance of a false positive. Um, uh, when we get a result, it's very clearly that there was, there was virus in that sample. Um, it is also important to remember that when you collect your sample is important in terms of when the test can, uh, will be accurate. If you uh, got infected today, let's say you got exposed today with uh, the virus and we tested you on Monday, your test would likely be negative because it takes about four to five days for the virus in your body to amplify enough to be detectable by a test. So, um, uh, you know, um, you may have to get tested again. If, if we tested you by Wednesday or Thursday, your test would be positive. So, and we've seen this in, in people already. So um, even though uh, the test is quite accurate, it does de depend on when you collect the sample from the person and where they are relative to when they got exposed to the virus. All right, let's go to the next uh, thing. So the lot, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, the ASU team has done a spectacular job in sort of setting up a whole pathway for how to collect samples uh, how to run the samples and how to get information back to people. We've got an integrated database that handles all of this. It is a what's called HIPAA compliant database. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, it, it means that it respects the privacy of the individual. So it's a very secure database where nobody else can see anyone's medical result. 
Um, basically, every person creates his or her own portal. You log into your own portal and you get your result that way. So um, it is true, and I will tell you that by law, all the results that we get get reported to the state. And that is true for a pandemic like this. Uh, when we get results, they do get reported to the state, but, um, but the results are private and nobody else can look at it. Um, and um, you, you, the, this database can be accessed by your cell phone or by your computer. So um, you know, people log in through that. They, they set up their, their time for their test. They run the test, and then they get their result back from their own portal. OK, next slide. Um, uh, I'm briefly going to mention some variants. Uh, because they are on everybody's mind right now. Um, I will first mention that the reason there are so many variants is because there's so much virus. The more virus that's around, the more variants that are going to occur. Uh, uh, biology is like that. Whenever you make a copy of a, uh, of a, of a genome or when any organism uh, replicates, errors occur in the DNA copying and new, new variations will appear. Um, there are several of, that are appearing now that have functionally different characteristics. The strain from the UK, what, what commonly called B117, appears to be a variant that is much more transmissible than the, the virus that we've been dealing with here. Um, the, the last data I have heard is that it's no more severe, it is just more transmissible. Uh, it, we do know that the, the UK strain, uh, the B117 strain, does respond to the vaccine. It is still uh, targetable by the vaccine that we're using in the US. Um, Nonetheless, if, if it were to take hold here in Arizona, for example, it would mean that we would need to reach a higher number of vaccination to achieve herd immunity because the more transmissible the virus is, the higher you have to go for herd immunity. The South African strain, um, uh, which is called the B1351, a bit more troublesome. Uh, that particular strain looks like it does affect the vaccine efficacy. Uh, and so we really have to keep an eye out on that one. Um, so far, it has not been reported in the US, um, but we really would prefer not to get it here. Um, you know, obviously, we want to deal with strains that are, are resistant. Um, and you know, the Brazilian strain is yet another strain. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not aware that it uh, evades the immune system yet. I need to look more into that. Uh, but again, all of these strains, uh, the more transmissible they are, the more virus we're going to have in our community, we really don't want that. Uh, we want to reduce the burden of virus in the community so that we um, we can get to herd immunity quicker and we can um, uh, get back to our normal lives. Keep in mind that um, th that th the emergence of strains is a reason to get vaccinated. The more vaccine we do, the the fewer cases of virus we have, the less we have to worry about these other strains. And so. Uh, all of this points to the need to get vaccination done. Next slide. Um, uh, so uh, Tamara alluded to this already. Um, the ASU does a lot of mass testing at, at, at statewide sites. Uh, Cardinal Stadium is one of them. I think the Muni Stadium is another. I think um, we may have other uh, places in Mesa and Chandler and others where we're now doing offering testing. Um, uh, the team there is just phenomenal. Um, we've only heard great things from people who've used them. Uh, typically, from the time you pull up till the time you're out, uh, it'll be 15 minutes at most. Uh, most people find that it goes very quickly, especially if you've you know, scheduled it uh, uh, at a reasonable time. You'll see it goes, it goes very quickly. The team is very quick. Um, you, know, you, you just collect the sample in your, with the straw in, in your car, and then you're out. So um, uh, I think these are the sites where the teachers uh, would be able to go to get their tests done. All right, the next one. Right, and then um, you know we've really said this already. I'm not going to belabor this. I think I've covered all these points. Uh, you know, we you know we we um, were the first to run saliva testing. I think we're still the only ones running. So maybe maybe that's not true anymore. I don't know. Uh, but for a long time, we were the only ones doing saliva testing in Arizona, uh, and certainly the first in the country to do public testing using saliva. So um, it's gone very well. Um, you know, uh, overall, we've been very happy with the outcomes there. Uh, I think this is most of what I have. Is there anything else on the next slide? Um, this is just the instructions to collect the saliva. Um, uh, we use the drinking straw primarily to ensure that we get saliva. What we don't want is phlegm. We don't want snot. We don't want any other secretions up there. Uh, we're really just the spit in your mouth is what we're looking for. And the straw does a good job of ensuring we get that. Um, that's crucial for our instruments to work. If they get the wrong substance, 
our instruments can't run the test. So, uh, and it won't be valid anyway. So, uh, but that's all it is. You just spit into tube. We actually have a video available on our website that shows pictures of, of uh, sour food to help you produce saliva in your mouth if you have trouble doing that. So um, if you ever need that, we have that available. Next slide. And this just summarizes kind of where we're at. Um, we're, as, as Tamara mentioned, we're close to 600,000 tests now, well over a half a million. Um, our turnaround time is quick. Typically people will get their answer within 30 hours uh, of when they do the test. So sometime on the day after you get the test, you'll get your answer back. Um, we, we run tests all over the state of Arizona, including for the Department of Health Services. Um, uh, so uh, it, it, it's a well-oiled instrument machine. All right, next. Um, don't need to tell you that right now things are not great in Arizona. We have a really high count number in the state. Um, uh, we are leading the country in terms of transmission. There's a bit of a hint that it's leveling off. I wouldn't start celebrating right now. I tell people that, you know, if you're in a car that's out of control at 140 miles an hour and you manage to wrestle it back to 130 miles an hour, you're still going way faster than you want to be going. And, you know, at 7,000 new cases a day, we're going way faster than we want to be going in Arizona. We don't want that many new cases a day. So, uh, right now, um, and right now, the number of deaths due to COVID in a 12 month window outpaces cancer. It is the number two slot. Yeah, here you go. Um, these are all deaths in, in, of, of COVID-19 and it is now the number two killer in the state. And probably in, in several days, it will become the number one killer in the state. It will, it will be the leading cause of death in Arizona, uh, over all other death uh, causes of death, uh, in a 12 month window. So, um, it's a serious illness. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to go into this. This is if you're well, if you're welcome to come to our website, which tracks trends. Um, we, you know, we post data every day uh, in a variety of different charts uh, uh, and even some tables uh, about what's happening currently in Arizona. So we track the different counties. We track um, how we compare to the nation and so on. Uh, and and uh, happy to help anybody here who wants to to follow that information. It's kind of a useful way to know what's going on in the state. I think that's most of what I have. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, I can. I think I can answer them unless we are short for time. Um, you know, Dr. LeBaire, one of the questions that people have been asking, and, and we're gonna have people covering this, but maybe you can speak to this as well, is um, why is it important to continue testing as people are becoming vaccinated, particularly in schools? Right, right. Well, um, lots, a couple reasons there. So first of all, um, uh, the number of people who've been vaccinated right now is tiny compared to the total population. So the amount of vaccination we've got so far is really not significant in terms of overall statistics in the state. Uh, that's really important to remember. Um, it's great that we're hitting people who are at risk of going to the hospital because we can ease up the burden in our hospitals but there's still widespread virus in the community. S secondly, we don't yet know if vaccines prevent people from getting an in and spreading infection. We do know the vaccines do prevent people from getting seriously ill. And of course, that's the most important thing, but um, they still might be able to spread virus. And so the best way to find out if people are um, carrying virus, and especially if they don't know it, is to do testing. It's the only way we know of, of finding out where the virus is. Great, thank you so much, Dr. LeBaire. We appreciate you and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, okay, great. So at this point, um, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Sklar. So Dr. Sklar is a professor in the College of Health Solutions and advisor to the provost at ASU. He is distinguished professor and associate dean emeritus at the University of New Mexico, where he was a chair of emergency medicine, associate dean and DIO for graduate medical education, and the associate dean for clinical affairs. Dr. Sklar received his medical degree at Stanford and did an internal medicine residency at the University of New Mexico and an emergency medicine fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco. He has authored or co-authored over 200 articles in medical literature and written two books, La Clinica, a memoir about his time working in a rural Mexican clinic and Atlas of Men, a prize-winning coming of age novel. He also happens to be lucky enough to be married to a colleague of ours here at ASU, Dr. Deborah Hellitzer, who's the Dean of the College of Health Solutions. 
and has four children. Um, Dr. Sklar has also kindly agreed to stay during the break and answer any questions you may have about COVID or vaccines. So please uh, put any questions you have for him in the Q&A box and then he will stay on after and answer them for you. All right, Dr. Sklar, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And um, so uh, as you just heard, I'm uh, a emergency physician and I actually take care of people who get COVID. Um, I also have unfortunately the bad luck of several family members who have had COVID, so I've had some personal experience, and I've also been vaccinated, so I can certainly talk about what that experience is all about. But before I begin, I do want to give some kudos to Dr. LeBaire, who you just heard. Uh, I, I think uh, what he has accomplished in a very short period of time is truly remarkable. He has developed a team. He's sort of the quarterback and the coach of our team. and I'm part of that team and has developed a resource for the whole state that uh, has been incredibly valuable. So kudos to Dr. LeBaire. And uh, I think we're so fortunate to have him and, and, to, and I'm fortunate to be part of that team. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about vaccines now because uh, I think that's what we're gonna really be uh, mostly focusing on. Uh, so vaccines, first thing about it is vaccines work. And um, as, as you can see here, when, when you have a vaccine, the disease really pretty much disappears. I actually have taken care of people who weren't vaccinated, who had some of these terrible diseases, such as tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, measles. So. Um, I'm old enough to have taken care of patients with these diseases, and in several cases, they died of them. Fortunately, now um, those the worst of them, smallpox, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, have pretty much disappeared. Uh, measles is, is very little, and uh, polio has pretty much disappeared. Uh, influenza we still have, but um, the vaccines do work. Next slide. And because of vaccines, we're all living longer. So around the turn of the century of 1900, the average lifespan was about 50 years uh, in the US, and now it's about 80. And, and a large part of that is because of vaccination. Children are no longer dying of these uh, terrible diseases, and they're living to adulthood and being able to live a long and uh, uh, hopefully healthy life. Next slide. Now we've heard a little bit about COVID and, and unfortunately COVID is a new disease. And so what that means is that we have not developed as a population any immunity to it because it is new. So uh, when, when we get exposed to a disease, we develop antibodies and in some cases uh, babies are born and they get the antibodies from their mother or they get exposed at an early stage. And, uh, and that helps us fight off the worst effects of the disease. But COVID is new and we don't have any um, antibodies to it now. Next slide. And I think you've already seen from Dr. LeBaire's slides that we've been developing uh, several spikes or surges of uh, disease over the last year. Uh, each uh, surge I think uh, has, has been bad, but we I think hoped that that would be the worst of it. Unfortunately, now we are in the throes of the worst surge and uh, I'll come back to that in a moment because what I don't want us to do is think, okay, if we get the vaccine, now we can stop doing a lot of the things that really need to be done to reduce this current surge. I think uh, we're gonna need to have the vaccine and continue some of the public health activities that will reduce our risk. Next slide. So what's a vaccine? Well, a vaccine is a substance that we give uh, the, it can be injected or it can be given orally or um, into the nose. And it um, stimulates our immune system by uh, bringing into the body uh, either a part of a virus or a bacteria that, that is similar to uh, what the actual virus or bacteria that um, causes the disease would, would create or would... Uh, introduce into the body. And so we then uh, develop antibodies uh, that will attack the actual virus or bacteria when uh, presented to us. So if we get the vaccine, 
and in uh, the best of cases, we will develop antibodies. And then if we get exposed to the actual virus or bacteria, we now have those antibodies that will attack the uh, virus or bacteria before it causes problems for us. And so therefore, um, we then don't have the severe symptoms or get very sick or die or anything like that. So um, vaccines can prevent um, and, and or reduce the severity of a disease and then reduce the spread of that disease because we don't have, we're not coughing or sneezing. All right, next, uh, next slide. So there are uh, uh, four types of vaccines being developed right now. And I'll go through these just very briefly, mostly focusing on the last, which is the one that we're mostly, uh, uh, that's what people are getting now in this country. Uh, and uh, so the four types of vaccines are, first of all, the inactivated vaccine, where we actually take the virus and kill it, and then uh, it will not be able to, to proliferate. But by then injecting it, we are able to then develop antibodies to the actual virus or bacteria or parts of the bacteria. But that's, that's an inactivated vaccine. Then there's protein-based vaccines where uh, some of the surface proteins from a virus or bacteria are injected. In this case, it would be the COVID uh, spike protein. And then that is used to stimulate our antibodies. Then there's the viral vector vaccine. So what happens is uh, some of the viral DNA is uh, actually put into another virus that uh, is not a dangerous virus. And then that virus is injected into the body. And then the DNA uh, creates RNA and then the proteins are produced that our antibodies uh, then respond to. And then the one that we now have is the gene-based vaccines. That's the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine that we're giving out right now in Arizona and all over the US. And in that case, we're, we're giving some of the uh, messenger RNA. Uh, it's actually in, it's, uh, injected into the body. And I'll show, I'll just show you how that works. But uh, as it gets into, and here's a picture of it, where the RNA is encased in a little um, fat nanoparticle. It's a little tiny uh, molecule that uh, carries the uh, RNA into the body and protects the RNA from being destroyed before it actually gets into the cells. And then that RNA produces uh, the uh, spike proteins, which then cause antibodies uh, to respond to those proteins, just as if we had an infection from the virus itself. So it's really quite a unique uh, type of vaccine. And because of the way it was developed, it was actually done very quickly. Uh, so that's, those are the uh, four kinds of vaccine. And this is the one that we're currently using. Next slide. Now, um, Unfortunately, there are some complications and uh, some side effects from the vaccines. The most serious complication is anaphylaxis. It's very rare, but anaphylaxis, you may have heard of people who have really severe reactions from bee stings, or uh, they may be allergic to peanuts or something like that. And that's uh, a uh, reaction that the body has where uh, you develop a rash and difficulty breathing, and sometimes the blood pressure will go down, and you feel very sick. Uh, fortunately, it's very rare. Uh, I think there have been out of a million uh, doses, about 10 cases. And uh, the people who have had those really severe allergic reactions are usually people who have had other kinds of bad allergic reactions to other kinds of either food or again, bee stings or something like that. Many of them already have the EpiPen, which is the uh, way we counteract those allergic reactions. But it's also the reason why if you uh, get vaccinated, we'll ask you to stay for at least 15 minutes to make sure you don't um, become one of those people that have the anaphylactic reaction. And then if that were to happen, they have the medication right there at the site 
that they can administer so that uh, you'll be fine. In any case, that's, that's the most severe reaction. The more common types of reactions are not so severe. Usually uh, just soreness in your arm that develops about 12 hours after the injection. The injection itself is pretty painless, but uh, people will develop pain in your arm, uh, sometimes a little fever, weakness, achiness, things like that. And uh, most people have had those reactions uh, for the second uh, vaccination. The first one usually goes pretty well. The second one, uh, some people, maybe five or 10% will have more of these uh, side effects, but they, they last maybe a day or so. And if you take Tylenol, you're usually fine. So not, not, not a really bad reaction. Next slide. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what we call uh, vaccine acceptance. It's really important that we get people to take the vaccine because that'll be our way of getting rid of this pandemic is to get everybody vaccinated. And there's a real variability in um, acceptability of vaccination based on countries. The US, about 60% of us are willing to be vaccinated, but another 30% or so are sort of on the fence. And hopefully as they watch others get vaccinated and not have any bad effects, they'll, they'll be willing. And then there's about 10% that are just really against getting vaccinated. And so our plan is really to try to get the 60% who wanna get vaccinated to be able to get vaccinated, to make it easy to, so that there aren't really uh, impediments. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute, but uh, so that uh, again, they get vaccinated. And then for the 30% who are on the fence to also be able to provide the information and hopefully uh, support from families and friends to get them vaccinated. And the 10% who don't wanna get vaccinated, it may, that may be a, an uphill battle to, to convince them, but hopefully they'll eventually come around and, and do that. Next slide. So how do we uh, raise vaccine acceptance? And, and as uh, many of you who are involved in education, I think you'll, you'll have a very important role with that. You'll be developing trust among your colleagues and eventually uh, with students when they start to get vaccinated. We can't do that yet, but eventually we will, I think. Um, you know, just being able to educate people about the vaccine. So developing trust is very important. And over the last few years, I think trust in our uh, whole system has been sort of uh, challenged by problems related to science and truth and so on. Well, so we need to rebuild that and do it through education. Also social media leadership, I think with the Biden administration coming in and, and requiring everyone to wear masks and providing leadership by showing that that's important. Uh, hopefully that will, uh, that will be helpful. And then, as I mentioned earlier, reducing the barriers so that when people actually get onto websites, they can actually get their appointment and, and feel confident that they'll get the vaccine and uh, making sure the logistics are really uh, very, very uh, eff uh, efficient so that when folks go to get the vaccine, there, there aren't long waits and, and that we're able to do it, uh, do it well. So those are ways of, I think, uh, improving vaccine acceptance. Next slide. Now I did mention children and uh, the tests uh, that were done on the vaccines uh, did not include children. So at this point, uh, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved uh, for children 16 and over and Moderna is uh, 18 and over. So unfortunately, younger children, although there are tests now going on uh, to, shoot, to show that it's effective and safe in children, uh, we uh, don't yet have approval to vaccinate children but I think that'll probably come in the next few months. Next slide. So what do we need to do now? Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, because the vaccine is surging in our community, we do need to continue to limit the current spread. And we are having uh, you know, five, six, eight, 10,000 new cases in Arizona every day. So we need to do the things that we know will reduce that spread, such as wearing masks, staying home as much as possible, social distancing, quarantine of people who are exposed or who have the illness, then making sure that we do vaccinate everyone uh, possible, trying to get to 80 or 90% immunity and doing that through education, 
social support and logistics. Uh, we also do need to provide good medical care for the people who do get sick. And that's sort of what I do. So I take care of people who get very sick in the emergency department. And uh, I think we are doing better with that. But uh, sadly, we are still losing people, some people who get really bad uh, cases of COVID. And it's heartbreaking. Uh, whenever I go into the emergency department and see people who were healthy previously come in and are really suffering, and then I, I can tell that they're probably not gonna make it. And it is really heartbreaking to see that. And, and it is real. That's why when people say, well, is this a hoax? Absolutely not a hoax, it's real. Uh, also providing financial support to people who get uh, COVID. Um, you know, I have a family member who works in the um, restaurant uh, uh, community and uh, uh, he got ill, he's a server and uh, didn't really have any uh, financial support from the restaurant where he worked. And so he had to take off two weeks from work, didn't get paid. And uh, you can see that it, that's really a disincentive for people to either be tested or to report or to quarantine because there's no financial support for them. And we need to do better on that. I, hopefully we will. And then we have to have health policies that really um, are more effective than, than what we've done so far. So I'm gonna uh, end there and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. I'm really open to any questions you have, personal, clinical, vaccine, although this is about vaccine, this is really also your chance to talk about any questions you might have. Um, so Dr. Sklar, we do have a question here. So um, okay. between the first and second dose of the vaccine, if someone is displaying COVID-like symptoms, do they need to quarantine? Also, once vaccinated, if exposed, will they still need to quarantine? Yes. So the answer so far at this point is yes. And there's um, a few reasons for that. First of all, after the first vaccine, you are somewhat protected, but you're not totally protected. So you could get COVID after the first uh, vaccine um, and could then be spreading it. So if you do have, uh, if you have symptoms of COVID, you should get uh, quarantined and be tested. Now, the challenge is that some of the uh, side effects of the vaccination are similar to COVID. So for example, fever, achiness, those are all very similar to the actual disease. And so that can be a bit of a challenge. And so we do ask people who are having those, uh, those symptoms after they've been vaccinated uh, to uh, monitor themselves. And you know, if they continue to have those, uh, those symptoms that they should actually get tested and uh, quarantine and um, until their test is then um, found to be negative. But um, the answer is yes, you can. And you can also get the virus, uh, get, get the disease even after you've been fully vaccinated. It's not 100%, it's about 95%. So there are gonna be 5% of people who, can, uh, who will still get COVID even with vaccination. Great, thank you so much. So someone else asked, after having COVID, how long should someone wait to receive the vaccine? Yes, well, that's a great question. And um, as it turns out, uh, probably about 20% of our population in Arizona probably have had COVID. And what, what the recommendation is, is that you wait about 90 days or so. I would say, because we know that there is a fair amount of uh, protection after you've actually had the disease, because you, essentially created antibodies for most people who have it, they do create antibodies. Although it's probably less so if you had a asymptomatic case. So if you had COVID but had no symptoms, you, your antibody production is a little bit less. But still, you know, you are somewhat protected after you've had COVID. And so we recommend about a 90 day uh, period before you get the vaccination. And that also allows us to prioritize people who haven't had COVID to get the vaccine who have no protection. So that's, that's the recommendation at this point. Great, thank you. And one last question for you before we move on. Where is the science with getting vaccines for adolescents and teenagers? Yeah, so for adolescents and teenagers, if you're 16 and over, you can get uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and, and so it was tested on groups like that. 
18 for the Moderna. Uh, there are studies right now going on in younger children. I think probably uh, it will have it down to about age 12 soon uh, once that data is reviewed and analyzed. So I, I would anticipate in the next month or two that we'll be able to uh, include uh, children under, um, well, down to the age of about 12, but that, that hasn't yet been validated. That's what it looks like. And then hopefully younger children after that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sklar. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And I know I certainly learned a lot from your presentation. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, good luck everybody and hope you learn a lot today. During the lightning round session, leaders from K through 12 schools and districts across the state will share major successes, lessons learned and current challenges they are facing. Each of these schools and districts are currently participating in a pilot project with the Arizona Department of Health Services and Arizona State University to help schools safely operate this spring. And it has been truly amazing getting to know these leaders and hearing about the extraordinary and honestly heroic efforts they have spearheaded to address this unprecedented pandemic. With that said, I would like to introduce Dr. Sherry Dorothy, Superintendent at Miyama School District and Mr. Glenn Lineberry, Principal at Miyama Junior Senior High School. Good morning, uh, Dr. Dorothy is gonna lead off on our end. Yes, it would help if I unmuted. Thank you for having us and good morning. Um, some of the successes that we've experienced is that we were able to build a consultative decision making process uh, based on data, collaboration with our health authorities and our knowledge of the community. And, and we use this process consistently. So there were no surprises to our population. We also had um, a steady and very transparent communication with students, family, governing board members, and our community, which was also very consistent. This is by no means been painless. Um, we have uh, one of the challenges, one of the, one of the difficulties we've had is that we have never really received effective guidance as to what we ought to do. Lots of great information has come from all sorts of government agencies, but it usually doesn't tell us how to do it in a school. So for instance, we knew when we started hybrid instruction that we needed to scan the temperatures of students coming in. And we figured out on our own that that meant we needed to scan temps of kids getting on school buses when they got on the bus so they didn't carry anything to other students. But what do you do with a kid who presents at the school bus stop with a temperature? If they're one of my high school kids, you tell them to walk home. It's not that big a deal, but what do you do with a kindergartner or a first grader? And we've never really received guidance on these things. The second thing that we discovered is that in many of our families, the computer we sent home was the very first computer in the house. And so these kids lacked the kind of technology support at home that most of us can unthinkingly provide to our kids. Just little things like, when the computer's not working, turn it off and turn it back on again, or use this for copy and paste. That, those sorts of, that knowledge and those skills just doesn't exist in a lot of our homes. Dr. Dorothy? Um, do we have any questions? There's some other things that I could bring forth if you'd like me to. Um, some of our challenges were that we maintain student engagement until we have, um, what do we do to do that? That's been very difficult. And I'd like to ask Mr. Lineberry one of the things that he did with um, a solution for that. <clears throat> well, the, yeah, the first thing is that, um, and mind you, we haven't done this very well. Um, but the first thing we did last spring when we learned how different distance instruction is from in-person instruction is we worked with a group at Mary Lou Fulton, the Office of Scholarship and Innovation, and developed a training for our teachers on how to use Canvas, on how to use Zoom, and on general distance instruction techniques. And that, I think, saved us in that it made our, it equipped our teachers with some basic skills and built their confidence that they could do this. But this has largely been a, a very a very difficult process. Um, it, we started the school year off 
on a distance basis and had real engagement problems, we were able to come back for nine weeks of hybrid instruction in the fall. And that gave us a chance to finally teach our kids how to use the devices that we'd issued. So that was a huge help. Some of the other things that we've identified too, and I know districts across the state, nation, and probably world are identified these as well, is how do we make up for the lost instructional time? Um, do we put that at the forefront? Do we put forth a social and you know our well-being um, for both our students and our staff? So um, it's very critical that we meet our social and emotional needs for all of our, our staff, our, mm -hmm. our students, and even some of our parents are very needy with that. So those are a couple of the challenges that we've also identified. And there's one more thing, and that's that we, we will, now that we've made these investments in technology, we'll be continuing to use this going forward. And a lot of our families can't afford effective internet connections. We were able to purchase some T-Mobile hotspots for about 300 of our families, but those will run out uh, at the end of the school year. Uh, and we have some locations, we cover about 1,100 square miles in our district and the town of Roosevelt, for instance, up at Roosevelt Lake, there is no cell coverage up there. We were able to strike a deal with Tri-City Fire Department where our kids can go and sit in the, on the picnic tables outside the fire station and use their wireless, but um, we, need, we need longer term solutions for remote areas and for families that can't afford internet access at home. I think that's most of what we have. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate both of you being here today and, and sharing these insights with us. Um, so at this point, we will go on to Vista College Prep. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Julia Meyerson, the founder and executive director of Vista College Prep. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Um, so would love to share just a few of the successes, um, definitely some of the challenges, um, and then um, Michelle, happy to, to go from there. But for our first sort of success that I can share, I think, you know, really around the communication and clarity around metrics uh, at Vista College Prep. So Vista College Prep, we're K-8 public charter school serving just over a thousand students in the Central City South and Maryville communities. And so a big focus for our team has been to clearly and transparently communicate our decision-making process uh, to all of our key constituents, just as you heard from uh, the other district that had just shared, um, our families, our students, and our staff. And so as a public charter school, we opted to use the Maricopa County School Reopening Dashboarding Guidance to really create an, a weighted average of zip code level data for our students and families. And so we didn't feel like just looking at the city of Phoenix or just the zip code of our school locations really represented our school communities. And so we were then able to use that data and monitor our cases on a weekly basis and share that with our team and families. And so concurrently, we were also studying how Arizona and other states across the country were using metrics to guide reopening planning. And so we created a phased reentry plan based on our regional zip code data. And in a weekly email to all staff and families communicated where we were currently at with our data how, and how that aligned with the metrics we set. And so our phases um, way back in the early uh, fall um, really called first for teachers coming back and then our youngest and most vulnerable students. And so we went back in the middle of October and while we were only in the building for two weeks until cases started to spike again, we ultimately didn't have any pushback from our families or our staff about the decision to both open at that point or close. Um, and I believe that that's because we were so clear and transparent about how we were making decisions at that time. Um, I'd say the second thing that I think is, is going well or that we've, we've, we feel like we've, we've done well over the course of um, the last 10 months or so is how we prepared for that return to the building. And so in preparing to launch our phased return to the building in October, we met with local and national experts connected with countless other schools nationally. And again, as you heard from the other district, um, really sort of finding that information ourselves um, and created a mitigation plan that I believe allowed our buildings to run successfully. And so we created a document that detailed nearly every scenario we could think of, created the corresponding action plan, including draft emails, draft parent emails, contact tracing protocols, and all of the various operational uh, steps in the building to you know, where kids would exit and where teachers would enter um, to ensure that health and safety was our, our number one priority. And so in preparation for that, we had countless all staff Zoom calls where we walked through all the protocols, 
brought teachers who were turning to the building to practice and do walkthroughs of all of those new protocols and redid the schedule to account for that extra time outside, hand washing breaks, for just all the PPE, HEPA filters, masks. Um, and while we communicated to staff and families that we knew it could be just one week that we were in the building, two weeks or more or less, um, it, you know, the fact that we were able to actually be back into the building and our, our entire team was really committed to making that effort to both test our systems in that smaller setting, push for in-person learning whenever possible, um, and really ensure that we were ready once we decided to bring all students back. Um, and again, I think as a result of our team's preparation and the leadership of our principals and our entire um, uh, network, um, that research and communication, not only do we not have any cases, uh, but I think our team and our families felt that while we were prioritizing getting back into the building as soon as possible, we never compromised uh, on ensuring health and safety, uh, which was our number one focus. Um, then to move into what we learned, which were, you know, many things over the course of, of these last 10 months, I think the first one that we, we learned, um, which is also why we're excited to be part of this pilot program, is that there was a real reticence uh, to get tested. Um, and so when we were in person and doing all of the protocols related to contact tracing, again, we first brought back our kindergarten and first graders and our most vulnerable students across second and eighth grade. And as you can imagine, with that age range, we had a lot of coughs, a lot of runny noses, symptoms that are unfortunately also symptoms of COVID-19, but as a mom and as a school administrator, also just typical of, of young children. And so at that time, with even just one symptom, it was recommended that a child stays home until they're symptom free. However, occasionally, obviously, students would have two symptoms. Parents would also have symptoms. And in that scenario, we would recommend getting tested so that a student did not have to be out for, at that time, that full 10-day exclusion. And so we found that our families and, and our school community didn't feel comfortable going to get tested and so would instead opt for that full 10-day exclusion. And we, we think, and after sort of a variety of different focus groups following that time period, that it was really as a result of a lot of misinformation in our community about the risks of getting tested, and most importantly, a question of access uh, to getting tests in our school community. And so as a result, we had so many kids at home with that 10 day exclusion popping in and out of virtual and in-person learning, it made the return to in-person learning um, just operationally and academically very difficult. Um, so very eager to get our testing systems up and running so that access is, is really no longer a barrier. Um, and then our second um, kind of final lesson learned is, is kind of tied to, to that first challenge in many ways, is that reticence to get tested was a need for an education campaign. And so we quickly realized that as a school, we needed to increase the opportunities to educate our families and staff about COVID. We're hearing a lot of misinformation about the virus, how you get it, how you can protect yourself. And in the absence of any sort of national directive and unified campaign, it was really on us to fill that void. And so we started adding COVID facts and information about the virus in our weekly emails, working on other partnerships to start a speaker series and ensure we're ready to provide science-backed information from the CDC um, and other sources to our parents and staff who need it, especially as we now embark on supporting our staff to get the vaccine. Um, and then finally, I'll just share our kind of current challenge, um, which is the, you know, how we are evaluating metrics as we now think about how to get back into the building. What metrics do we use and how do we, with clear science-backed evidence, evaluate them? So we continue to hear and read that schools themselves are not the super spreaders we once thought. Uh, however, that statement's always caveated by as long as community spread is not under control. And so I and I think our network team is in full agreement that with the right mitigation strategies, schools, schools can be safe places for students and teachers. However, our mitigation plan controls for what's happening just inside our building. We all want to be back in person. And so our current challenge is what does as long as community spread is under control mean? Um, and we've really not been able to get a, a solid answer on that. And so we're in agreement that our past set of metrics where, you know, 6% positivity, we would do X and 7% positivity, we would do Y doesn't work now. Uh, but our, in our community with our regional uh, set of zip code data, our uh, percent positivity is now 26% with cases per 100,000 at 950. Um, and so that's clearly different than where we were back in October at 6%. Um, and so we're trying to assess now when does it become operationally impossible to open? When is it truly unsafe? And how can we create some guideposts to evaluate returning to the building? And that's it. Thanks, Michelle. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I just have one question for you, if you don't mind. 
Um, what have you done to help students overcome learning loss and academic regression during this time? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think first and foremost, um, like you heard from the other district, I think we really tried to prioritize access. Um, we also provide transport when we're back in the building, we provide transportation, uh, which we think, you know, it's not choice unless you have access to that choice. And that's exactly how we feel uh, in terms of the uh, technology access as well. So we went fully one to one. We were not a one to one school before. Um, we ran a first time ever summer school program uh, over the summer. We also partnered with Boys and Girls Clubs and a few other uh, NAU and others uh, to increase impact over the summer to our kids, ensured all of our students had hot spots that needed them. Um, and I'd say our big academic focus for the, you know, over the course of the last really five to six months has been a full dive into synchronous learning. So in the spring, we were far more asynchronous where, you know, we'd have recorded lessons, things like that. We really fully switched to being fully live or synchronous in all of our classes across kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, a really strong focus on small groups uh, for guided reading. So we sort of divided up our early elementary where, you know, kids are in groups of five or six, getting that sort of one on one, quote unquote, five to six kids uh, to one teacher, um, individualized attention. We use something called the step assessment. And so kids are kind of in their step groups receiving that guided reading instruction. Um, we increased the amount of intervention opportunities. So we were originally running more sort of um, you know, still sort of the full groups Monday through Thursday, we've added additional intervention blocks on, on our Friday schedule. Um, and then just a huge focus on attendance, constant, you know, really thinking about incentives. How are we ensuring that all of our kids are showing up every day so that we then can focus on, on the engagement on the back end? Um, so I'd say that those are some of the ways we've tried to prioritize ensuring that, um, you know, really pushing back against every notion that this is going to be a lost year for our kids. Great, thank you so much, Julia. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. So next we have Tucson Unified School District. Um, and I'd like to introduce Leslie Lenhart, who's the Director of Communications and Media Relations at Tucson Unified School District. Great, thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Leslie Lenhart. I'm the Director of Communications and Media Relations for Tucson Unified. And for those of you who aren't aware, Tucson Unified is the largest district in Southern Arizona with over 40,000 students and 88 schools K through 12. Um, and as our district, we are one of the uh, only districts in, in the Pima County area that has remained remote uh, because we have decided as a district to always follow the science and the metrics to make sure that um, our transmission rates are in a minimal to moderate level, which in Pima County has not happened um, since the start of the pandemic. So um, some of our successes, just um, to start off, is we uh, created as a district a cross-functional team that really worked closely together to develop web, um, web policies and, and actions and, and access for our families. It included everything from curriculum instruction options, online learning resources and platforms that we were using, um, additional professional development for our teachers, um, as well as um, district policy changes and um, resources for our parents. So as far as how to use the various platforms that we were um, engaging in and making sure that all of our students um, had technology. As a district, we had to deploy um, almost 20,000 computers. Um, so many of our students are from lower income families. So computers like some of the other districts are not something that is common in their homes. So keep getting those into the hands of everyone um, as well as Wi-Fi access. The second thing that we felt went really well is the partnership that we had with the Pima County Health Department liaison team. Um, they really have been a great part for, for us, helping us understand where the metrics are, um, explaining what they felt were um, the interpretations of some of the safety options that we may, should make sure are priority for our district. As far as lessons learned, um, a couple of the things that we really felt were challenges for us was the lack of partnership between the state and county entities. Um, we felt that there was lots of varying opinions and vague input for schools. So we really had to um, ourselves dig in, filter through the facts and really find our own best practices 
um, between you know what we were hearing and what we are some of our other communications with other districts in the area of how they were mitigating and making sure everyone was safe. Um, the second thing that was challenging for us as far as the lessons learned is the many changing and different metrics between CDC, the state, the county, everyone had a different interpretation and what was an important metric. Um, so for us, that made it a little bit more challenging. Um, what we were really hoping for is that at least on the state level, there would be a universal message of what we should do, um, especially in the school districts, because there was little input or very vague and general input there. Um, so for us, getting the state leaders and county leaders all on the same page um, would have been great. So we had to manage through those speed bumps on our own and develop what we were going to do um, and what we felt was best for reentry plans for our district. Uh, currently, our, we have three big challenges um, that we've identified amongst our team. Um, one is um, every school that uh, per state order has to have a learning space. And so being able to keep staff, um, healthy staff in those learning spaces um, for our students that need to be on campus um, has been challenging. Um, so due to the isolation and quarantine um, requirements, we totally understand why we have to have those, but because we are a remote district, having to have those in-person spaces has made it a little more challenging. Um, the second challenge for our district has been vaccine distribution across Pima County. Um, we have trying to manage and understand the varying processes and methods that it is being di distributed in Pima County has been very difficult. We have the state doing one thing, we have Banner Health doing another, we have Pima County doing a third. Um, and as a district, it almost is like a free for all. Wherever you can find an appointment, you know, instead of having a universal, here's the process we'd like your district to go to um, and your locations, really people have been just trying to jump at the chance of getting a vaccine if they're in the appropriate group. Um, because like most schools, um, we want to get back on campus. Our teachers want to be back in person with their kids. And so the vaccine distribution is super important to where we are going. Um, and then our third challenge, and we hear it from um, both our staff and our students, is the concern of um, mental health challenges that people are having to the amount of stress, the varying things that they're dealing with in either within their own family or within their watching their students, some of the challenges they're having and how do they manage and support them. And so getting enough mental health support out there for um, our district, for all of, of our leaders, our teachers, our students um, has been really important. Our counselors and social workers have done a really great job but I believe as um, throughout the pandemic, um, most people have been challenged in some way for, from the mental health side. And so when, as we look forward, we're really hoping that um, our leaders can begin to work together um, so that as a district, we can figure out how to make up for some of these learning losses that all of our students are participating in. Um, you know, we've set up additional tutoring sessions and summer school or boot camps that will be happening um, in our schools over the next, you know, as we go into the summer break. Um, but it really is challenging to um, not have a universal message and really leaving it up to every district to figure it out on their own, uh, which we're happy to do, but a little more support would have been, um, would be very appreciated. And that's it. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I do have one question for you. What has your district been doing to help students with special needs? Sure, so um, on our campus or in our district, we have over 7,000 students that have uh, different types of special needs. Um, and so those students are among what we call our high risk students. Um, and so we actually have brought and developed um, on campus in-person learning for them. Uh, we have um, what we call our hubs. So there's, I believe, eight hubs across our district 
where these students go um, during the normal school hours and are able to get all of their regular um, in-person learning as well as um, occupational or physical therapy, different things, support systems that they might need that we would normally give them uh, within when we're in a quote unquote normal year um, and not all remote. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here today, Leslie. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dr. Quentin Boyce, um, who is the superintendent at Roosevelt School District. Awesome, good morning. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be able to share a little bit about our, our community uh, down here in South Phoenix, Roosevelt School District. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity just to talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing and things that we're working through. Uh, a, a couple just really quickly out the gate, things that have been going really well, successes for our community uh, as we navigate pandemic. I'm really excited and, and, and proud of our technology deployment plan. Fortunately, prior to pandemic, we, we invested heavily uh, in, in brand new devices for our community. Uh, every, every student has an Apple device and every teacher has two. So from that perspective, prior to uh, the pandemic really hitting home and shifting from a traditional in-person experience to a virtual experience, uh, we, we had devices, which was a huge uh, benefit for our community to move in that direction of virtual learning. So that was one huge success. The other one was we, we've been very intentional about standing in the gaps for our families uh, beyond teaching and learning. Teaching and learning is what we're charged to do. Uh, but additional context about our community, nearly 100% of our families qualify for free reduced lunch. That gives some context to our demographics. And so uh, we, we do teaching and learning as our, our main uh, jam, but we also stand in the gaps for, for any other need that our students or families may have. Uh, and, and that's included you know, over a six month period during 2020, providing roughly a half a million meals to our students and families. In addition to that, uh, while we had amazing and beautiful devices, we needed to help close the, the digital divide. And so we worked with community partners and, and solicited donorship, and we were able to get uh, our students connected uh, at, a, at a pretty alarming rate. And, and right now, proud to share that every student that, that needed help with high-speed, reliable internet, we've been able to intervene and help provide that resource so that virtual learning uh, can indeed look different and be more meaningful. Uh, so that, that, that is another big success for our community. Uh, some of the things that we've learned, virtual learning is hard. Uh, nothing about our system outside of having, having those beautiful devices prepared us for shifting everything to a virtual format. Our teachers, administrators, support staff, uh, all feel like they're back in year one of their profession, no matter how long they've been doing the job. And so we doubled down on professional learning during the summer of 2020, uh, just to try to equip our community and, and we created a whole suite of professional learning experiences to make sure that our, our teachers felt equipped to start the 2021 academic year. And it was pretty ambitious. We, we created a lot. And, and what we realized, what, the, what we did realize was uh, that there is a such thing as, as too much professional learning, considering context and anxiety of it all just still feels so different and new. Uh, and so in hindsight, we, were, we, were, we listened to our community uh, we were more intentional about differentiating that learning. Some, some professionals, they were all in. Uh, they were super comfortable and excited to, to take in more learning. Uh, others needed additional help. And uh, another lesson learned, number two I would share, uh, is there's no such thing as an, enough communication. We've been navigating impossible decision after impossible decision. And one may think that we've, we've done ample communication for both our internal and external stakeholders. But what we quickly realized is we, we need more. Uh, even if the update is, there is no update. And so we've, we've been a little bit more intentional about thinking through what our communication protocol is uh, going forward. A couple of challenges that we currently face, uh, we're still navigating through. One is pandemic fatigue. And I'm sure that's a reality for everyone. Whether we're talking about students, parents, or staff, uh, everyone is fatigued. Teaching and learning is looking incredibly difficult or different rather uh, than it has in the past. And that, that difference is palpable. And so reminding everyone that this too shall pass uh, is definitely key to keeping people encouraged. I worry about the social and emotional needs of our students uh, and the sanity of our staff. And because we're human, we, we're we carrying things outside uh, of, of work as well. We get countless emails about loved ones passing away and financial hardship. And so just keeping people encouraged 
while everything around uh, continues to look difficult is, is something that we, we work through. Uh, and, and another challenge that I'll share uh, as I wrap up is that uh, in our South Phoenix community, uh, there's, a, there's a real challenge when it comes to COVID resources. And so large scale routine testing, we haven't had access to, which is why I'm super excited about upcoming partnerships. Uh, while, while our numbers in South Phoenix have been high uh, compared to, to county average, just having access to resources to help our community navigate and persevere in the face of a pandemic is a challenge that we, we're currently navigating and we're reaching out to all stakeholders looking for uh, additional support. So that wanted to share just a little context about our, our community down here in South Phoenix at Roosevelt and happy to be a part of, of this experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyce. If you wouldn't mind just answering one question for us before you um, have to sign off. So it seems like right now there's a tension between people who are experiencing COVID fatigue um, and are loosening up on mitigation strategies. And then there's also a lot of simultaneous fears and anxieties about going back to school in person. Um, can you talk about some of the ways that your um, district has been addressing some of the fears that parents may have and anxieties that your population may be experiencing? Awesome, great question, thank you. So one of the things that kind of goes back to the communication point, uh, figuring out a way, and we've been working on partnering with uh, healthcare professionals and creating uh, virtual sessions that parents and students can engage in and ask questions, really is getting information out. Getting correct and clear information out is, is a big strategy in helping to disarm. Uh, what is real anxiety and, and understandable anxiety? You know, our community, so many of our students live in multi-generational homes. And so it's not just it's not just child and parent, but it's grandparent as well. And we know that in, in this pan pandemic, there are certain demographics that have been hit harder. Uh, so our, our, our job, our strategy, one is to create space for as much real uh, and appropriate and accurate information, which is, is partnering with healthcare, healthcare officials. Uh, and the other thing I would say is we just continue to share the mitigation strategies that we're implementing so that people know that, that you know, schools are doing a lot to create as safe of an environment as possible. Uh, but big answer is communication. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. And I know you're on two webinars this morning, so we really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a good one. You too. So at this point, um, we are going to move into our Q&A session with subject matter experts. Um, and so I would like to introduce you to our panelists this morning. Um, so we have experts from Arizona State University, the University of Arizona, and the Arizona Department of Health Services, who are going to be doing their best to answer some of the questions that you posed during the registration period. Um, so I'm going to pose the first question, which is going to be for uh, Dr. Jean, which is, what metrics are important for schools to consider when making informed choices about safely operating, opening, and closing? Oh, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. So as of uh, December 2020, children and adolescents uh, less than 18 years have accounted for approximately 15% of all COVID cases reported in the US. Um, efforts to reduce COVID-19 in families and communities, in addition to mitigation strategies in schools and childcare programs, um, are important for preventing transmission to kids and adolescents. And so, you know, we know that what we see in schools is a reflection of the transmission in the larger community. And that's the reason for the three main school benchmarks that char characterize the different levels of community transmission. Um, and these three benchmarks that have been put into place include um, case rates. So the number of people infected with COVID-19 per 100,000 uh, population in the area that the school serves percent positivity or the percentage of PCR diagnostic tests that are confirmed positive out of all tests performed in a select area um, and COVID-like illness percentage of hospital visits. So this comes from our hospital surveillance system um, and it monitors the percentage of people um, who visit emergency rooms and hospitals with COVID symptoms. And this is one of our first signals that a de decrease or increase in community spread is occurring. 
So, you know, all three of these are important metrics and taken together, they give a summary picture of community transmission. Um, but it's also important to note that these are general guidelines and the state has said that they will support jurisdictions who are able to maintain a safe learning environment, uh, regardless of the levels of community transmission. Um, you know, and here in Maricopa County, um, they've really emphasized that the, the recent publications that have shown benefits of in-person learning, particularly in elementary schools, and uh, emerging data indicating that in-person school attendance is not a risk factor for youth testing positive. Um, so the guidance here has been to preferentially keep elementary and middle schools open for in-person learning whenever possible. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is for Dr. Aaron Krasnow, who unfortunately was unable to make it today, but he sent the following response for me to read on his behalf. Dr. Krasnow said there are, sorry, Dr. Krasnow said there are little things we can do every day. For example, mitigation efforts like mask wearing, hand washing, social distancing, and big things like policy, education, and ensuring access to basic needs that all mitigate the spread. All of us can do the little things and together they add up to major impact. But only some of us can tackle the big things even through their impact, even though their impact affects all people. If you are one of the people who can influence policy, provide essential support such as financial aid, food and emotional support, then your impact is magnified and you have a special role to play. But no matter what, if everyone also takes the little steps, the spread of this virus is harder and fewer people will get sick and die. Dr. Jean, do you have anything that you would like to add to Dr. Krasnow's response? No, I, I think he really hit the nail on the head. You know, usually when we try to illustrate this point, we show a figure with lots of layers of Swiss cheese. And essentially you think about all of these interventions being imperfect, they all have little holes in them, but if you layer enough of them together, um, you can really reduce the opportunity for the virus to spread. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I have another question for you. A lot of school employees have been asking how and if protocols around mitigation strategies, such as mask clearing and social distancing, testing and quarantining can change once most of the teachers and staff have been vaccinated. Do you have any advice for schools or thoughts about how policies may vary depending on the availability and rollout of vaccines? Uh, well, um, so that's a great question. And um, right now, as of today, there is no change to the CDC, to state or the county guidance about mitigation efforts as a result of a vaccination. Um, and this is primarily because the vaccines are not 100% effective. 95% um, is still incredible, but it means that one in 20 um, still could potentially get sick. Uh, we also don't know whether you can spread the virus, um, even if you're vaccinated, and we don't know how, how long the immunity lasts. And so, I, you know, I think these answers are coming and we do expect the guidance to change pretty soon as the uh, science is evolving, but, you know, right now, the no changes to the guidance. So, um, you know, I think more broadly, this, this question is also speaking to our collective desire to get back to normal, right? Um, and I heard many of the panelists say that we see people relaxing their efforts. Everyone is fatigued. Um, you know, we want something or anything to allow us to ease up on these restrictions. Um, the vaccine is the best hope for this someday, but the mitigation efforts are truly, you know, as of this moment, still our best chance to stop the spread of the virus. So, you know, when we reach more of the population vaccinated, um, we'll have sort of a combination of the mitigation efforts plus the vaccine. And then hopefully one day being vaccinated alone will be sufficient um, to control the virus. But again, uh, that time is not now and not in the near future, unfortunately. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we had an earlier question that was specifically related to quarantine um, in terms of what, what guidelines are folks following for, for staff, um, CDC is recommending anyone should quarantine for the full 14 days, now 10, if you're exposed to reduce the spread. So I, I think just some questions around best quarantine guidance. 
Uh, Dr. Jean, do you want to answer that? Um, sure. Well, I can't speak to what everyone is doing. Um, I know in Maricopa County, that recommendation to the schools is, is the 10 days following the CDC change from 14 to 10. Um, and so they have put out that recommendation to the schools. And, you know, there is in that CDC guidance, there is the opportunity to um, leave quarantine at seven days with a negative test. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so this next question I'm gonna to direct to Philip. Um, many schools have expressed concerns around how to encourage and enforce social distancing on campus. Can you please give some examples of what ASU has done to address this on our campuses, such as in classrooms and common areas like dining halls? Absolutely, thank you so much, Michelle. And, and so some of, some of my answers will be advantageous for a university setting in comparison to uh, a K-12 setting. Uh, and then some of them are actually more challenging for us. But we initially started by having every student, faculty and staff at the institution uh, go through a training and actually a, declare a commitment to our community uh, and acknowledge that they were going to participate in um, all of the mitigation efforts. So basically by having them sign quasi contractual language around mitigation strategies allowed us to really implement a strategy of mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing, et cetera, that we knew that they would more or less abide by um, somewhat under fear of, of penalty. Um, but, but moreover, we really just guised it all under a commitment to what we call the Sun Devil Way and the Sun Devil Way of Life. And so on campus, we've taken all of our common area spaces and made them reservable. So we still allow individuals to use those spaces, but they need to reserve it. Uh, and they, ha they have to stay within uh, CDC guidelines for congregation. Uh, in terms of our classrooms, we have um, really cut our um, in-person attendance, which I know is a luxury we have at the university, in half. So any classroom that was normally 24 individuals would now be at 12 individuals with 12 individuals uh, attending via Zoom or other technologies. In our lunchroom spaces and our dining hall spaces, um, we've been able to go to grab and go only. Again, a luxury I know we have at the university. Um, and then what we did is we increased and created new outside and outdoor space for people to be able to congregate. And we actually went ahead and built on our campuses some permanent structures um, with fans and those types of things um, for people to be able to still um, congregate outside um, while observing social distancing. Uh, and then additionally, throughout all of our space, we have an ongoing campaign um, and communication campaign in um, every single um, entryway and every single elevator all throughout campus to renew uh, and reemphasize the need to continue to wear masks, et cetera. Our biggest challenges, as you can imagine, are within our residential halls where people are um, expected to live. Um, and so we've really asked our students um, to not have a lot of outside guests come into our residential hall spaces. It really is just for residents only. Uh, and we've been able to keep our on-campus student uh, infection rate under 4% the entire fall semester um, with, the, with a little blip around week two. Um, but once we got that under control, um, our students have really taken um, a lot of pride in keeping our rates low. So it, it's really a commitment that we ask our students to make. Um, we ask our faculty and staff to make, and then we just continue to emphasize that through communication um, that we're happy to share with everyone. Thank you so much. I have one more question for you right now, Philip. How do you think school administrators can address and dispel misconceptions about COVID-19, including the safety and effectiveness of vaccines among students, staff, and parents? Yeah, so again, one of the key things we've been able to utilize, and, and I'm sure if, if I'm speaking to people that are only at the elementary school level, it might be slightly more difficult, is really letting our students drive the messaging and, and drive um, the information. And so uh, instead of taking a top-down approach, we really engage with our student government, with clubs and organizations, with student leaders, and ask them um, to make sure that they were leading the forefront of our social media campaigns, um, making sure that they were the individuals walking around campuses, setting good examples. Uh, and so as an example, this spring, we're creating a speaker series um, where we're looking to do a bi-weekly conversation with our students on um, really um, general use language around vaccines, around mRNA, 
uh, around giving our student body an understanding of what goes on in a vaccine and why it's really important for our overall ability to stay at ASU and stay in person. Uh, and that's all being driven by our Programming Activities Board, uh, an organization called the Student Health Advisory Board, and our, and our uh, student government. So one thing that I would really encourage, especially those that have high schools, um, is the availability and ability to have your students um, make these commitments, but then also be the individuals that step up. And so we have many different campaigns, um, even in our vaccines right now, um, that we call mask up sleeve up. Um, and so again, it's, we want you to wear a mask and we want you to raise your sleeve and get that vaccine. And so we promote those by giving out stickers, by creating social media stickers, by creating um, ways for individuals to show off that they've made this commitment. And so we have so much pride in our student body to be Sun Devils that they really want to engage in this space and uh, who doesn't like a sticker, right? So um, just trying to find fun little ways to engage um, our students in, in really leading us in making sure other individuals are aware of the, the importance to make these commitments. Great, thank you. I know everybody likes stickers and free stuff, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so Stephanie, this next question is for you. Um, several schools have reported confusion around where to have their staff vaccinated. Can you please explain how the vaccine distribution is being handled by the state, counties, and other entities, such as hospitals and schools, and provide leadership on this call with recommendations for how they can most efficiently vaccinate their staff? Sure. Thanks, Michelle. So the vaccine rollout um, has been very complicated and continues to be very complicated. The supplies in Arizona remain limited and we just we cannot meet the current demand. And, and uh, that's actually a, a good problem to have because we know we'll get more supplies um, in the future. We do expect this uh, limitation to continue for at least a few more weeks. On top of the supply issues, we have multiple partners that are simultaneously implementing vaccination plans, and they are all just a little bit different. So we have our primary partners, which are the county health departments. We have the state-run vaccination sites, which are currently at the State Farm Stadium and the Phoenix Municipal Stadium. Um, and then we have public-private partnerships that are beginning to roll out as well. The state and federal guidance provides just a basic framework for, free, for phased rollout. And this is where it was decided that school and childcare staff would be included in phase 1B. But because of the limited vaccine supplies, and then the fact that each county has unique population groups, the rollout is very inconsistent between counties. Counties also, in some cases, have um, sub-prioritized the prioritized list uh, due to these population groups and the limited supplies. As an organization, your LEA should communicate with your county health department. And in some instances, we've been able to coordinate vaccination um, either on site or within a community site uh, with district uh, teachers and staff as the primary audience. As an individual, you should visit azhealth.gov slash find vaccine. This has the most up-to-date information about vaccine availability and can help you find a vaccination site near you. So as I said, we have all these partners helping to roll out this vaccination, and this has also led to confusion with the registration process. There's multiple platforms you can use to register for your vaccination. And so again, that azhealth.gov slash find vaccine that site's gonna be the best place and the easiest place to access all vaccine appointments all at one time. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. I just have a quick follow-up question for you. Um, I know that some people have been wondering, um, you know, do they need to get their second shot at the same place or through the same entity that they got their first dose of the vaccine? Um, is, is that something you can speak to? Yes, that, that's a great question. And you can receive your first dose and your second dose at alternate sites. You just have to make sure that it's the same vaccine. Um, so I can speak to Maricopa County. We have some sites giving Pfizer and some are giving Moderna. So if you get Pfizer the first time, you have to make sure your second is also Pfizer. 
that find vaccine website will also include which vaccine is being administered at each location. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We really appreciate it. Um, so, okay, the next question is for Jennifer, who is um, faculty at our Edson uh, College of Nursing and Health Innovation, but she also used to be a school nurse. And so, Jennifer, we've received a lot of questions um, from school nurses about how the Binax Now antigen tests that are um, offered by the states of the counties are administered and analyzed. So can you briefly explain how this test is administered and maybe the difference between how the antigen test is administered versus an NP swab um, and uh, how it can be used on school campuses? So in other words, how and under what circumstances would you use this test at schools? Uh, Michelle, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, as she says, I practiced school nursing for over 20 years. Um, and uh, more recently, I'm teaching at the College of Nursing, trying to spark uh, nurses' interest in my love, which is community and public health. Um, our goal as a school nurse is to keep students in school. So uh, I know someone was speaking earlier to the kindergartner who would come in and have a runny nose, which they often do. And you know, how do you determine whether it's COVID or just a runny nose? So I think um, a lot of the schools have uh, uh, policies in place to determine who needs tests, who doesn't need testing, but having something in the school would be wonderful to do. That way you wouldn't have to unnecessarily send students or staff home and have the, the, the long quarantine periods. Um, this Binax Now Antigen card seems to be something relatively simple and from what I know is relatively inexpensive. It'd be nice if, this, if, if, if it was in school district budgets to have these. You have school nurses, most, hopefully most of you do on your campuses. They're the experts in public and community health. First of all, I would recommend that you, you, know, you, you seek their guidance. They know how it runs, um, what's best for your school. But this Binax Now Antigen card is as I said, it's pretty simple. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. So that's kind of nice because you can keep them in your locked cabinet. Um, you would use them for students or staff who have active symptoms of COVID. Uh, not just, you know, you're not gonna use it to determine if they can come into school events or, you know, uh, if they can return to school after having COVID, but you could use them for the symptomatic people that are on your campuses. Um, it's like a credit card uh, size little kit that you would be able to um, you know, write their name with a Sharpie on it, open it up. You would do a, um, you know, you have a little reagent, um, oh, a little bottle to put some uh, drops in this card. And then you would collect uh, a, a sample, a respiratory or a nasal swab specimen. The nice thing about this is that it's not the nasopharyngeal. It's not the one where we go all the way up. We did a lot of that testing with uh, some people in, um, back in April and uh, you know it's not that comfortable but to do this one it's only like an inch um, into the nasal uh, each nasal uh, each nostril and you would maybe go an inch into you get a little resistance twist it a few times gently take it out put it in the other nostril twist it around um, and then put it into this card um, there's a little hole that you could put it right into um, shut the the card and time it for 15 minutes. So it's really nice that you could have a, um, a test with it or a result within 15 minutes. Even for kids, you know, as, I mean, a little kid, it's going to tickle, but you know, it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, you use the same swab for each nostril, putting it in there. Um, so to me, I think uh, uh, it's something that's, you know, would be very feasible to have in any school health office, as long as you had the, you know, the area to do the testing, getting the results back, have enough little timers. So if you were for some reason testing five kids at a time, you could have five little timers set for 15 minutes so you don't get confused on the time. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I, I know about that. And as a school nurse, I would have loved to have something like that in my office. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. We really appreciate it. Um, this next question is for Brianna who has been overseeing our site operations for our testing sites since day one. Uh, Brianna, how can schools help their community members, such as students, parents, and staff, locate and access nearby testing sites statewide? Hi, yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. 
Um, it's actually really easy. So azdhs.gov, they're uh, right when you type in that website and go there, they have a whole map right on their front page that allows you to type in a zip code. Um, you can zoom in or in and out on the map um, to see locations uh, nearby and it lists the times and hours of operations and days of operations. Um, and it includes all of the ASU saliva tests and lots of different other organizations that are providing um, testing as well. Great, thank you so much, Brianna. Um, okay, so our next question um, is for Dr. Uh, Lebas Nuno. Can you please describe what your research has shown about the impact of COVID-19 on child and adolescent mental health? And what advice would you give to all the school leaders on this webinar who are looking for ways to provide students and parents with social and emotional support during this time? Good morning, thank you for having me. First, I'll start by telling you that we have a cohort study underway. We're, we're designing it currently. There's nine investigators from ASU and U of A that are looking at the mental health impacts of COVID-19 among other aspects of COVID-19. So that study is underway. But to do that study, I've been spending a lot of time looking at the literature. And so here I'll give you a brief synopsis of what I found. So since November 1 to January 20th, in the state of Arizona, we have seen the cases of COVID-19 triple in that time. Pediatric hospitalizations have increased by 4,000% 4, 4, in the state of Arizona. So we're looking at not only the direct impact of COVID-19, so the physical effects of symptoms, but we're also looking at indirect effects um, such as job loss of somebody in the family, um, learning online, uh, loss of socialization, uh, the emotional costs that come with isolation. And so studies outside of Arizona have shown us that suicidal thoughts and attempts among 11 to 20 year olds who present um, in emergency room departments have shown an increase. There's been an increase in 2020 that's compared to 2019. And another study found uh, children in quarantine were more likely to report stressors than children that were not in quarantine. All of this is no surprise to you all because you are seeing the social and emotional impact of the virus. So let me shift gears to ways to be supportive. First and foremost, I want to stress taking care of yourself is not a luxury, it is a necessity. And if you're like me, you're thinking, how in the world am I gonna find time to take care of myself? I barely, I'm barely able to get through what I need to. So here are some examples. Um, taking a few minutes to eat a meal, catching a power nap, allowing yourself to cry, giving yourself permission to feel your feelings, whatever they are without judgment, Taking a walk, or if you're into working out, doing that. Taking five deep breaths. Notice your self-talk. If it's critical, then find positive thoughts to replace those critical thoughts. And recognize the fact that you're here, or the fact that you showed up to teach, or to show up, show up at your job in light of the pandemic, the racism, and the political unrest, deserves recognition. And then enjoy moments where you are in the moment. So practice staying right at what you're doing. If you are teaching, that's what you're doing in the moment. If you are writing a manuscript, that's what you're doing. If you're washing the dishes, you're focused on washing the dishes. As far as students, my recommendation and what my reading shows is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. This looks like um, creating opportunities to meet the students where they're at, giving them chances to socialize in small group activities, switching them up from being with their friends to being with people they don't know, maybe groups of about three. Some successes I've seen is uh, creativity in teachers who have assigned stuff like creating a Netflix series or using storyboard comic strips. Um, Things to keep in mind when children and adolescents are depressed is hard to concentrate. 
So expect some disorganization and forgetfulness. I also recommend reducing stress by rethinking activities that produce anxiety, like time tests or competitions. And my last recommendation would be to find the good, honor it, and recognize it. So it's important to think about what is not going wrong at this moment. Um, and those pieces sometimes get unrecognized. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Megan, do we have any questions for Dr. Legas Nuno? We, we don't have any posted, but if, if other folks have follow-up, um, I know this is a topic of great interest. Please feel free to pose in the Q&A. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna go on to one other question and then we might return to you if that's okay. Um, so Philip, this last question is for you. There's a lot of parents who are struggling to support students while learning at home right now. And many students are feeling disengaged and falling behind. What resources are out there that can help? Yeah, so we have an entire program at ASU called asu for You, which is um, our continuing education, adult education, and um, just general public access to educational site. And on that site, we have an entire virtual um, teacher, virtual educator um, component that we really encourage all of you to take a look at. And I know, uh, I believe, Michelle, you'll be following up with an email to everyone, and we have that link included in there. And there's a myriad of resources right there for helping at-home educators, including parents um, that are now turned into educators due to the pandemic, that helps people um, to create new and fun ways to think about engaging via Zoom. How do you create an engaging environment in your home? How do you help to educate and separate space in your, in your place to help educate? Um, and so there's a myriad of resources right on that website that are all available for free. And then we are also um, offering some of our trainings through our uh, prep digital space, which is a K through 12 digital educational space um, for any district that wants them. So um, any way in which ASU can be helpful to you as a district um, to help your not only educators in the classroom, but also your educators at home, um, help your students prosper during this time, we're, we're availing that to you. So it's ASU for you. Uh, it's a completely free resource dedicated to just this topic. Great, thank you so much, Philip. Um, so at this point, we are actually going to um, go into our closing remarks and next steps. So I just wanna say thank you so much to all of our panelists and subject matter experts who were uh, helping and, and volunteered their time on a Saturday to be here. Um, I know most of us at ASU are working mornings, nights, weekends, and we have been since March, like many of you on this call. So um, I really appreciate all of you so much. Um, I would like to close today by um, uh, letting you know that as a very small token of our gratitude for your participation, the Center for the Future of Arizona will be providing everyone who attended with a professional development certificate, and you will be receiving that by email around February 5th. Uh, we will also be reaching out to email you a list of resources. So Philip has put together a really excellent toolkit of free resources that are available to you that you can use as educators, that you can share with your communities, with parents and with students. Um, we're also going, we're recording this and we're going to make this recording uh, available to you so that you can share it with your communities. Um, we'll break up the videos so that if you would like to increase awareness around testing or vaccines with your communities, you can send out or post little snippets of this video. Um, and we'll also be sharing the full video as well. Um, we'll also be reaching out with a survey because we'd really like to gauge your interest in convening among your similar types of schools um, to build learning communities across districts. So we know that this emergency will not be the last, unfortunately, and we want to make sure that you have a community of your peers that you can turn to and support each other, share best practices, problem solve, um, and come up with solutions together so that you don't feel like you're in this alone. Um, and I just want to, um, at this point, then turn it over to Dr. Amanda Burke with the Center for the Future of Arizona, who has a quick announcement before we end.
Thanks, Michelle. I just wanted to share with you all as we talk about the vaccine, um, certainly now there's an issue relative to supply and demand, but once we're able to meet the demand of those who want to be vaccinated, we know we're gonna have to turn our attention to figuring out how to support those who may be less sure. And I wanted to make you aware of a resource and we'll include this in the follow-up set, but the Center for the Future of Arizona recently conducted the statewide Gallup Arizona decennial survey. And we asked in that survey um, it, to how Arizonans think about the vaccine, what are some of the factors that will influence them in deciding to take it. And we've actually published because of the timing and how important this issue is an early look at the results through the Gallup organization. Um, that includes what information do Arizonans trust? Um, and I can share that medical uh, experts are at the top, um, but the data is by demographics as well as by regional data. And so I think that could be helpful for many of you as you're working within your communities on those information campaigns. And then I just wanna add my thanks on behalf of the Center for the Future of Arizona for your time, for your interest, and for all the incredible work that you're doing every day on behalf of kids students or kids, students who are students, teachers, faculty, and the larger community. So thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. On behalf of ASU as well, we appreciate everything that you're doing for our children, our communities during these really unimaginably difficult times. So we just really want to let you know that we appreciate you and we see everything that you're doing and we value you. So thank you so much. I hope today was useful and helpful and we will be in touch soon. Be well.